Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Center for Open Sciences Love Data Week uh, presentation webinar on sharing sensitive qualitative data. We're very excited to, to have everyone here with us today. Um, a couple of quick housekeeping uh, items. Um, feel free to use the chat uh, to share any resources or um, introduce yourself if you'd like to talk about uh, a bit about yourself, what kind of research you do, anything like that. Um, we have a Q&A uh, section, um, and um, so that will um, be for questions for our presenter, Dr. Rebecca Campbell. So if you have questions during her talk, um, feel free to use that function, and then I'll um, help to moderate that after the talk. Um, we do have everyone but Dr. Campbell and right now myself uh, on mute, so feel free to, to use the chat um, as needed. Um, this session is being recorded. It'll be available on our YouTube channel probably within a few days. Um, and we are very excited to have everyone here. So um, to introduce Dr. Campbell, um, she is a university distinguished professor in the Ecological Community Psychology Program at Michigan State University. Her program of research focuses on violence against women and children with an emphasis on sexual assault. She studies sexual assault survivors' help-seeking experiences with the legal, medical, and mental health systems and how community and campus systems address survivors' needs. She works collaboratively with social systems to community-based participatory action research using quantitative and qualitative methods. I'm very excited for her presentation today. Um, so with that, um, I will uh, go off camera and give you the floor. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate the invitation to be here. Um, I am Rebecca Campbell. My pronouns are she, her, and I am a professor of psychology at Michigan State University. And I appreciate all of you taking some time from your schedules today to join us for our webinar on sharing sensitive qualitative data. So first off, let me say I'm new here. <laughs> I'm new here in the Center for Open Science community. I'm also kind of new in this whole open science movement thing. And that is largely due to how I was trained and the kind of work that I do. So I am a community psychologist, and that means I do all of my research in community-based field settings, all of it. Most of my work is participatory action research. That means I am working collaboratively with community partners to both study a social problem, but also try to figure out solutions and evaluate those solutions to that social problem. I do a great deal of mixed methods research um, with a lot of qualitative interview data collection. And my topical focus is sexual assault, um, how community systems respond to sexual assault survivors. So my focal population for most of my research is talking with sexual assault survivors. So in my circles, in that professional circle, open science isn't really talked about as much. And it, it often seems like, well, that's something kind of other areas work on. So like in psychology, we're like, oh, well, that's what the social personality folks uh, think about. Folks who do laboratory research and do theory-driven hypothesis-focused research that's largely quantitative, that's largely survey and experimental and, and with non-traumatized populations. Um, that said, I also would describe myself, though, as being very open-minded and curious about open science practices. I believe in transparency as a value, personally and professionally, and as a practice. It's very critical in the work that I do that I am transparent with the survivors, with the communities that I work with. So to that end, I do share my data and have shared my data consistently throughout my career. Um, it's largely been the quantitative data that I've been sharing, um, but I have shared some qualitative data in the past. But all that said, I didn't feel sort of a huge sense of immediacy or urgency to really wade into the complexities of open science for the type of work that I do until I received a grant <laughs> from the US Department of Justice Office on Violence Against Women and buried in the grant was special conditions number 10, the data archiving plan. Applicants should anticipate that OVW will require, including a partial withholding of award funds, that data will be submitted to the National Archive of Criminal Justice Data. 
So for those of you who may not be familiar with NACJD, this is a very longstanding archive um, in my world um, that holds criminal justice, uh, crime delinquency, victimization data. It's been around since 1978. It's maintained by ICPSR at the University of Michigan. Some of its data sets are fully open and public access. But given the sensitivity of the type of data that this archive holds, some of the data sets um, are behind a wall, so to speak, and they require an application, a review, and a vetting process before the data are released to make sure that it's going to qualified folks that can handle the sensitivity of the data. So our particular project was going to be addressing what's called the National Rape Kit Backlog, and I'll tell you more about that in just a second. It was a continuation of a very long-term, uh, 10, 10 years plus now, community action, community-based participatory action research project I've been doing in Detroit, Michigan. And yes, the funder makes the location of the project public information and promotes it. So as we're going through today's webinar, I am starting at the space of everybody knows I am working in Detroit. So the location is not confidential. It is not private. Okay, so let's do a little quick sidebar to tell you just very briefly about the substance of this research, because it's really important context for today's webinar, is it very much shaped some of the dilemmas we faced and the decisions that we made. So I said this is about the rape kit backlogs. So what the heck is a rape kit? After a victim has been sexually assaulted, they are advised to go to a hospital emergency department to seek medical care but also to have this rape kit collected. Um, and what that is, is a, a complete full body exam to collect all of the evidence of that crime that's been left behind. So a doctor or a nurse can swab the body for blood, saliva, semen, all of that is packaged up in those little envelopes you see there. It's all bundled into a kit. And this kit is then released to the police. And the police are supposed to take that kit and submit it to a forensic crime laboratory for DNA analysis. And that DNA analysis can help with the investigation and the prosecution of the reported assault. But what we've learned um, is, is that police have not been submitting these kits to laboratories for DNA testing. And going back as far as the 1980s, they've been putting these kits in storage, untested. And those are called rape kit backlogs. And they exist in all 50 states, big cities, small cities, rural communities. Um, and this, as we've been studying, as my community has been studying this, it's often framed as a very profound institutional betrayal. And that's how survivors experience it. They reported this to the police. They went through this honestly pretty invasive exam, thinking and hoping and expecting that the police would do something with this evidence and instead they didn't. Um, and there's many reasons why the police don't test these kits, but what we see um, converging across many different studies of different types of settings is, is that it wasn't an institutional priority. They, they just weren't going to investigate and prosecute these cases. And so they literally put these kits on a shelf. So our grant project, what we, this is, is that we were going to do qualitative interviews with the first cohort of sexual assault survivors to have those old backlog kits finally sent to the lab and tested, and these cases were finally prosecuted. So we would be interviewing survivors and they would be recounting the assault itself and how they were initially responded and treated by the police, which was not going to be good. They were gonna be describing the prosecution of their cases, which would be very challenging and emotionally difficult. And they would be talking about their health and healing journey after the assault, after this institutional betrayal. So I was worried. I mean, to put it mildly, I was worried. Um, I was worried about many things. <laughs> One of the things I was worried about was creating a safe trauma-informed environment. As a trauma community psychologist, I've done a lot of projects. So I felt, you know, with a lot of intentionality, we could do that. But I was also very worried about protecting their privacy and their confidentiality, given this mandated data archiving requirement. And how would we release these transcripts to this national archive in a way that would prevent the re-identification of their data? 
And that's really what we're going to focus on today. So when I say open science, I'm actually talking about a pretty narrow slice here today of archiving data in a particular um, national archive and a particular set of focal concerns around preparing data for distribution and sharing in this national archive. So our team wrote a paper about this, um, published in Advances in Methods and Practices in Psychological Science. If you haven't read this paper, I hope today's webinar will encourage you to go take a look. And if you have read this article, today's webinar will pull this curtain back even a little bit more and share a little bit more of the behind the scenes information that didn't make it into the article about how and why we did what we did. So first off, we had to start with what we called phase zero, which is if we have a requirement to share these data in a national archive, then we need to tell the survivors that before we collect any data. So we needed to start with informed consent. So we developed a trauma-informed protocol for informed consent basically how to talk to a traumatized population about this and why you're doing this. Um, we wrote a, a paper about that protocol if you're interested. And, you know, this is the language from the consent form. So as part of our agreement with our funder, we're required to share anonymous transcripts. Um, we promise before we share it, you know, we'll take out all of the usual suspects, you know, your name, any other names, dates, and any other details about your case that would be identifiable. That is a sentence very easy to write, <laughs> it is very easy to say, and it is very hard to enact in practice. So I'm going to put a pin in that because we're going to keep coming back to that. It was something that we didn't think through when we wrote the consent form, and it's something that we had to think through in a lot of detail over the course of this project. The other thing that we did in this consent form as part of our trauma-informed practices is, is that we gave up the survivor's opportunity to withhold some of their data. So we said, if there's specific sections or things that you've talked about in the interview that you don't want included in the transcripts that we're gonna share and archive, you can tell us at the end of the interview and we'll remove those. And I appreciate that some folks may wonder why we did that. Happy to talk about that in Q&A, but we felt that given the level of trauma and betrayal that they had experienced, it was important to give them this choice and this control. So we're gonna put a pin in that too and come back and we'll let you know sort of what happened. If we give people that option, do they take it? So once we had um, all of this in place, we could start our data collection. We interviewed 32 sexual assault survivors. Again, that first cohort, um, that's a pretty typical sample size and qual research. All of them agreed to participate. All of them agreed to data archiving. They didn't have a concern with it. The interviews were incredibly rich and detailed. There was no indication that by telling them we're gonna archive your data that they withheld information, they were incredibly forthcoming. They were honestly incredibly painful interviews. Um, we also took the opportunity to ask them about this archiving requirement. So like, what do you think about this? Why'd you agree to it? We wrote a, a paper about that if you're interested. And they had really positive views about it. They felt pretty passionately that they wanted other people to understand what they had been through. They wanted other researchers to learn from their experiences. So they were glad that there was an opportunity to do that. And then we come back to that question of, we gave them the choice that they could take data out. Um, they didn't. Only two of them requested redactions prior to archiving, and those redactions were not substantive. They were two, two women who asked that we remove profanity from the transcripts before it was archived. So we collected our data, we went about our normal process, we did our data, qualitative data analysis for the qual folks here. Um, we used Miles Huberman and Saldana's um, framework um, and Atlas TI um, version eight was our analytic software. We did member checks with our victim service agencies. We wrote our grant final report. Our funder requires a very substantive final report. We got all the way through that and it's like, now it's go time. Now we have to prepare our data for the archive. So the first thing that we needed to sort of grapple with was is we had 32 transcripts with, I mean, a lot of information, a lot of incredibly personal private information, and we needed to figure out, okay, wh which pieces and parts of this need to be remediated or what, what, what's potentially identifiable? What are the clues here somebody could use to re-identify who this person is? 
So to do that, we turn to available guidance to sort of help us through how we're going to do this. So first off, I would say at the 50,000 foot view, we have IRBs, our IRIBs. So we went to the IRB and we said, okay, we've, we've got to do this, um, this uh, de-identification and archiving. Can you help us with this? And their reply was, well, your consent form says, you know, name, dates, any other identifiable information. So do that. And we said, we know um, we we need some help and a thought partner in this. And and again, no disparaging them. Their reply was, "Do what your consent form said." So we're like, oh, "Okay." So I'm going to put a pin in that too. We're going to come back at the end to talk a little bit about sort of what we wanted and hoped for from our IRB. Lovely people, but but it wasn't the guidance, uh, a source of guidance that we were hoping for. Sort of at the 25,000 foot view, we had the archiving guidelines of the archive, the National Archive of Criminal Justice Data. This was helpful just in sort of helping us think through, all right, what's the format? How do we need to, you know, what documentation do we need? At the 10,000 foot view, now we're getting into a little bit more about, okay, well, what do we need to take out? What is it we're going to need to do here? So obviously the HIPAA safe harbor um, identifiers was useful. The qualitative data repository creation handbook was useful too in helping us think about kind of the buckets of issues that we would need to think about. And then at the ground level, we found some examples in the published literature of qualitative researchers talking about showing how they prepared or remediated data prior to sharing it. And so we had those. But the problem was where we were in that moment is like we weren't at the ground. We were below ground. <laughs> we were buried. We were at the roots level, literally sort of completely overwhelmed with the incredible sensitivity and emotionality of this data. And we kept coming back to that thing. Any other details about your case that would be identifiable? Well, it felt like there were millions of details in those interviews that were identifiable. And, and we literally sort of felt buried, you know, there was all this guidance, but it wasn't sinking down. It wasn't coming down to the level where we were at. So a key lesson learned in this project is, is, is that qual researchers very likely are going to need subject matter experts, not open science experts, although those were helpful too, but we need subject matter experts to give you that root level guidance, people who know your topic and your population and can really be your thought partners in unraveling what's the identifiability risks. So for our project was the victim service agency staff, as well as the prosecutors, the prosecutors who prosecuted these cases. So I want to tell you a little bit about these consultations and how they were helpful to us. So if you haven't worked with prosecutors in your life, um, you may or may not know, but might guess from TV, they are a lovely argumentative bunch of people. And if you're explaining what you're doing to them and you can basically get through to the other side with them, you've been able to have all of the holes poked and filled because they're a tough, tough, tough group. So I'm explaining to them what we need to do. And they're like, okay, so let me get this straight. You have this, this research transcript and within this, you have all of these different pieces of information. I'm like, yep. And they say, all right, here's what you need to do. You need to pull out each of those data pieces represented here as a dot. So they're like, so each and every one of these pieces has to be evaluated. I'm like, uh-huh. And they were instrumental in giving us sort of a, a framework to think about this. And they said, well, you're going to want to think about who else knows that information? Well, one of the people who might know that information is the perpetrator themselves. Another person who might know would be the prosecutor, the victim service agency. Maybe it's the person who is sitting in open court the day that this case was prosecuted. So think about the who's, who else knows this information? And then think about how, how do they know that information? Do they know that information because they're the one who perpetrated the act in question? Do they know about it because they heard it in open court? How else do they know about it? And then what other records, data sources also contain that information? And in our case, that's a court record. It's a court transcript. It's a trial transcript. They're like, all of the stuff that you cover in your interviews is going to have huge overlap with a publicly available document. And long story short, yes, you can get those by name. If you can get one of those, you'll get the name of the perpetrator and you might get the name of the survivor too. This kind of 
pause made us pause and sort of freeze in our tracks because it meant that our research interview had sort of this ghost or companion document out in the publicly available ether that contained quite a bit of the same information. So we're going to have to figure out how to de-identify in a way relative to these transcripts. So the prosecutors um, helped us figure out how to get some of these publicly available transcripts. We sat down, we looked at them to get a feel for that kind of information. And then it was once we had that sort of lens on this and it's like, okay, then each data point, we pull it out and we look at it. What's our options? Can we retain this? Is it safe to retain it? Can we keep it, but remediate it, blur it in some way, shape or form, or are we going to have to pull it out of the transcript and redact it because it just can't be there because it's identifiable or it's a really important piece of information that can re-identify and so then at the end, we're going to put everything back into a remediated transcript that is both qualitatively different than the original transcript and quantitatively different. It's going to have less information and the information in it is not going to be as detailed and rich. So with that framing now, we could sit down and start working through each of those little dots in all 32 interviews. So for our remediation coding, we formed a team. This was done by multiple people. Some of them had really deep knowledge of the interviews. They were the interviewers. And we wanted to do that because they knew, they knew the sore spots. They knew the sensitive spots. They knew what was really hard for those survivors. But we also had a person who knew the substantive area but didn't know the interviews. And we wanted to have someone with a little bit more distance um, to sort of look at that. Maybe they would see things differently, but also sort of as a check to say, if you take all of this out, do, does the transcript make any more sense? So it's kind of we were starting to think about not just protecting privacy, but future usability of the data. So we had kind of a mix in the team of who was doing this work. And then everybody's assigned their transcript and they would go through dot by dot, read, reread, read, 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 read the transcripts. I'm putting a pin there because there's a lot of cost in doing that over and over again. So they would look at this, they would pull out the proverbial circle, tag it, and say, this is a piece of information at risk for re-identification. We were using Microsoft Word at this stage. Um, it worked fine. I wish we would have stayed in Atlas. We can talk about that later. But I think it also sort of reflects that at this stage, we're still thinking about this as sort of a just a simple recoding task. And you could just do that in Word. But we did need to create an audit trail, some deliberation. So we just used the comment box as a way of deliberating. And the initial coder would, would make a proposal. Um, I propose that we remediate this by blurring and here's the way it should be blurred. I think this should be redacted and here's why. And they would propose a plan for each and every dot. So you can imagine what the comment section looks like. It's just layers and layers and layers of comment boxes. And then we would have team review and discussion about the proposed remediation plans for each dot in each transcript for each survivor. Multiple rounds of discussion until we came to consensus, we made the plan, then the coder would implement it, and then we did multiple checks to make sure it was remediated in the way that we agreed upon. So now you want to see some examples, right? I'd love to show you some examples. I'm a little hamstrung here because the whole point is, is, is I can't show you the unredacted data because it has identifiability risks. So in the writing the manuscript, we tried to think about, okay, how can we show our work here? And so we're going to try to talk you through some of the dilemmas and the choices and show you as much as we can. And again, what I hope to show here in the examples is how our team started sort of thinking, going into this entirely about privacy and confidentiality. And as we did this work, having to broaden our lens to think, yes, about privacy and confidentiality, but usability how these decisions would affect the usability of the data that we would be ultimately archiving. So we'll start off with the easy ones, names. Simple one, safe harbor, everybody knows you take the names out, it's in the consent form, easy peasy. And by and large it was. And there were a lot of names in here because they would refer to their friends, the service providers, the perpetrators by name. So this is a straightforward thing, you just remediate it by taking the name out and putting the name of the, the role. So perpetrator, detective one, detective two, and the like. Here's one where it wasn't so easy. Because these assaults um, were finally prosecuted, they're prosecuted in open court, this became a known thing in survivors' lives. 
And many of them talked about as it became known in their lives and in their families and in their circles, other people in their social networks often disclosed that they too had been assaulted. And so we had within the transcript a secondary disclosure of an assault so by, you know, uh, assault experience of somebody who's not our participant, didn't agree, didn't consent to any of this. So we're like looking at this and we're like, okay, so we're going to need a little bit more blurring here. Um, and if we just changed it to mother, took out the name and put the role mother, that blurs it, except that should, you know, something fail along the way and this transcript is, re you know, re-identifiable, this, this poor person's identity um, is now blown and their story is, is now known in a way that they probably didn't want. So we would um, first for the name, instead of putting the category mother, everybody just became family member. We felt that was kind of a minimal um, trade-off in usability. Yes, some people, future users might want to know that it was a mother versus a generic family member, but that's okay. Um, we felt that that was important for protecting the privacy of this person. In terms of the details of the assault, I'm going to cover that in just a few slides of how we handled all of the assault narratives to protect that. But again, here we had to kind of blur to a much higher superordinate category than we initially thought we would. All right, let's talk about dates. We promised we would take out the dates, um, and we did. Um, we took out, you know, I was assaulted on this date, my court was this date, so the transcripts just say date redact. But one of the things that was really substantively important in this project was the delay, the delay in justice. They reported in 1990, the kit sat for 10 years. They finally was tested in 2012. They went to court in 2015. All of those dates are interesting to me um, as a psychologist doing research in the criminal justice system. And I, I knew that my other CJ um, colleagues would be interested in those dates and wanting to know sort of how they overlay with different legislation. And we can't do that um, because those dates, if you know those dates, you can start to narrow down and get to our transcripts. So instead we introduced time intervals. So we would say, you know, a five-year interval, a 10-year interval, and we don't give the dates that stop and start the interval, just the amount of passage of time. That's kind of a moderate trade-off in usability. Um, we knew that people would be um, disappointed that the dates weren't there. They would understand why the dates weren't there, but that was what we felt was a reasonable compromise in the privacy and the, it's still trying to give some usable data to future users. All right, now the biggie, the assault narrative. So survivors told us what happened. They told us what happened in these assaults, both to them and as I said, sometimes in secondary ones. So our approach was to start this with remediation. And our plan was to blur. So we would take the text where they're describing the rape. And we also know that it's out there in a court transcript because you have to retell the story of the assault in the court. So we're, we're mindful that there's this other record out there. So we're trying to kind of go through sort of line by line, sentence by sentence and remediate specific words, you know, particularly um, salient, unusual words. We're trying to blur. We're trying to smudge. We're trying to kind of keep the story there, but remove or blur to superordinate categories or remove distinctive phrases. And this was tiring. It was frustrating. And it, we weren't sure it was working. And then it was one day in our research team meeting where somebody said, I feel like I'm rewriting her story and that doesn't feel okay. And I wrote that down in my field notes because everybody was like, yes, that's that among other problems, it's like, this is somebody's story. You don't rewrite their story. Their story is their story is their story. It's a very fundamental thing in our, in our field, in our world. So we're like, okay, then what are our options? And what we decided to do then was go to a much more extreme um, option and we redacted, we redacted the story. We couldn't like take it all out because you need to know what happened in the assault. Given that we're pretty experienced researchers in this, I know what kinds of details many future users would want to know. I don't know all of them, but I know many of them. And there are kind of a standard set of things that researchers want to know about an assault, um, particularly in the criminal justice system. Was the perpetrated by a stranger? Were there weapons? The set and the other. So we made a list of what are those common variables that are coded about assault narratives. And we wrote a summary giving the answers to those questions. 
that future users would likely have. It's not, we're not changing their words. We are assuming responsibility for the task of removing it and giving back information to future users around the key variables. We felt this was a mild to moderate trade-off in usability. If you really wanted the narrative itself, the data won't have that. But if you want to know the variables very likely, then the transcripts will have that. Another big chunk that we were worried about was victims' experiences with the legal system because a lot of narrative about that, their initial experience reporting to the police, the court. So again, we approached that the same way we started out with the assault narratives where we were planning to do that sort of line by line, word by word, remediation and blurring. But here we actually had a completely different experience of, of where we ended up versus where we started when we realized we could actually retain huge chunks of this with very minimal redactions. So you see there, for example, this is a quote from one of the interviews. It's right there. I had two separate incidents in the rape kit backlog. That's not an identifiable piece of information. We had a lot of those. Um, redacted details of first assault, known assailant. Um, they, you see the age of the assault. I reported to the police and outside of treating me basically like garbage, like a whore, like a liar, they threw me away. So in date redacted, when I was kidnapped off the street by a stranger who turned out to be a serial rapist, I was a little more hesitant to cause the police, call the police. So we'll have a moment for what this means, <laughs> that this is not identifiable. This is actually really common, like literally the words garbage, whore, and liar, when we cross-checked against other transcripts, even those terms are not unique and identifiable. This was a very common experience. It's a substantive finding um, of our project, but it also made us made it possible for us to hold on to bigger chunks of data than we ever thought, because this is not unique information, not at all. Last example was health and healing. So we asked them about that. Um, most of this we could remediate um, with a blur. So they would talk about health, mental health, physical health. Um, again, we didn't want to distinguish mental and physical health. Even that felt a little too potentially identifiable. So it just became a very superordinate category health condition. And when they would talk about their healing journeys, again, that was a situation where we couldn't really remediate on a word by word level. And it was really very private, private, very sensitive information. So whatever we could blur, we did. And otherwise, we just had to, we made the decision to redact it. And we acknowledge that that piece will be a high trade-off in usability, that, that future users will not have access to some of that information. So some lessons learned out of this phase, this was a very time and labor and emotional intensive process. And we learned what is identifiable and what may be traumatic are not necessarily the same thing. So we read and reread and reread traumatic material over and over again, um, trying to figure out how to remediate it. And that increased our vicarious trauma. So I'm going to put a pin in that. We're going to come back to that as well. Final phase. Um, we're done, right? Ta-da. I mean, we have an original transcript. We pulled each of those dots out. We, we did who, how, what, where, all of that. We deliberated and deliberated, and we put it back in. We now have these remediated transcripts. Well, a lot happened <laughs> between the left side and the right side of the screen between day one and day whatever it was. So it felt like we needed a little bit more here. What we thought was going to be kind of a simple, honestly, like word task in Microsoft Word became coding. But the coding actually became an analysis. There was, this was a very deliberative decision making. This, this was analysis. So you need a validity assessment and qualitative analysis. So we needed to assess the validity of our de-identification, not just the coding, the analysis, you know, the whole, the whole thing. We decided to use a very classic framework for our validity analysis, Lincoln and Guba. I'm going to put a pin in that. Was that the right choice or not? We'll come back to that later. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all of Lincoln and Guba's um, criteria. I will talk a little bit about credibility, though. Um, confidence in the accuracy of the findings. How confident are we that, that this was accurate? So we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what the heck does accuracy mean in this? And, and basically we operationalized it as, did, did it work? <laughs> you know, we, we took a whole bunch of information out or remediated or blurred it trying to protect the identity. 
Are they re-identifiable? Well, you have to be kind of careful about how you test that working hypothesis. So we provided agency staff with a set of remediated transcripts. These are the agency staff. They knew who these women were. They had worked with them all throughout their court experience. And we said, can you read this? And can you tell me who it is? Can you re-identify the survivors? And the answer was no, they couldn't. Um, that we had blurred and removed enough um, that they could not tell which client it was. So we would say, we think slash hope it worked. Again, you'll see the pin there is something to come back to later, but it was, we felt a reasonable way to assess credibility and, and it did give us some confidence that we had done a good job in getting identifiable information out of there. So I'm gonna wrap up with a few reflections, lessons learned coming back to those pins and then we'll open it up for um, your questions and discussion. So let's go back to the pin about the IRB guidance. Again, lovely people, my IRB. Um, and this is a quote actually from our, from our paper, our discussion section. It's like, we followed this, but we found ourselves wanting more consultative support from our, our IRB. We even made point to say, we're not disparaging our IRB colleagues. We're just highlighting sort of the limits of their training and the limits of their role. They were very focused on the front end of the data, making sure we had informed consent, but on the back end of the data where, you know, I would argue there's just as many IRB and ethics issues, they were not, not our thought partners there. So I think it really behooves us, who, those of us who do qual work, who do sensitive work to really think about what, what is it our, our eyes need? And they seem to be sort of less and less involved, more and more hands off. And I, I would like them to be a useful thought partner to me and my colleagues doing really difficult work to sort of think about what are the re-identification risks. Another key reflection I want to come back to was the vicarious trauma. I mean, we, we, we went through a lot in this project that comes through in the paper. Hopefully it's coming through in the webinar. I mean, rereading these things over and over and over again. And I have to say that this was kind of a gah moment for me because I literally wrote the book on vicarious trauma in sexual assault research. Um, and I was mindful of it. I was paying attention to it. So it wasn't like I completely forgot everything I've ever thought about, written about. And, and you know, we use strategies for that, but we didn't quite have enough gas in the tank to get this car across the finish line. Um, it was very hard. So we needed a team. We needed a larger team. We needed more time to do this, to give people the breaks that they needed to mitigate the trauma. So I underestimated the impact on us and I underestimated the time and resources it would need. So I share that as a way of, for myself and others to say, you're going to need more time so you can rotate people in and give them the breaks, the mental health breaks that they need to step back and take some time off. This also made me think about, well, does all of this have to be done by people? Um, what can be automated? And I, and I had this sort of notion coming in. It's like, oh, I'm a little teeny tiny small project. I'm 32 cases. That automated stuff is for the huge, you know, healthcare data sets. And I would love to see sort of more efforts to try to scale some of those automation methods down to the little people like me doing little small scale qualitative stuff, because there's probably some stuff we could have automated, I was unfamiliar, unaware, and just didn't have those connections. So that's on me too, in terms of my professional networks. But I also raised this to sort of remind folks doing those automated things. Yes, it's for big projects, but boy, it'd be really helpful for us little ones too. Coming back to this question of, did it work? I mean, I you know, let, let's go philosophical here for a moment. What does that even mean? I, I really don't know. I felt like we operationalized it in a reasonable way. Could the transcripts be re-identified by people who know them? In the review process for the manuscript, people said, one of our reviewers said, is Lincoln and Guba a reasonable choice? I'm like, it's the choice we made. It's a very, very classic, commonly used validity assessment. Was it designed for this? Heck no. Although I will highlight that you see actually, and you read these working definitions of each of these constructs, there's like open science-y stuff in here. The findings reflect the participants' views, not the researchers' biases. Um, the findings are um, you know, consistent and could be repeated. So I actually think it did have some utility here, um, but I, I do think it's kind of a TBD for those working in the open science space and qualitative, what does validity look like? How should we be assessing this? And how do we assess utility of the data? I think those are really remain open questions. 
And then finally, as I said at the top of this, I came into this sort of thinking a lot of the open science stuff is is in other areas, but I, I've learned it's in and should be in all the disciplines and research settings and, and paradigms and designs and data collection and, and research populations, it, it can and should have very broad applicability. Transparency matters. Um, but I think that that needs to be tailored and customized and contextualized to the type of research in the population because risks are relative. And what is best practice in one area may not be best practice in another. So I'd like to challenge us to sort of think about how do we take these principles and apply them and contextualize them to different types of research. So with that, I will finish my formal remarks and say thank you all for joining. And I need to say thank you to my incredible set of colleagues that went with me on this journey that did this work, uh, Dr. Javorka, Jasmine Angleton, Catherine Fishwick, Dr. Gregory, and Dr. Goodman Williams, really, truly an amazing set of folks. So with that, I'm going to stop uh, sharing my screen and bring everybody back for the Q&A. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, the chat is just filled with folks who are so happy and, and grateful that you have, have shared this process. Um, I We have a lot of questions that have come in in the chat and in the Q&A. So I'm going to try to bounce around a little bit um, because it, they came in as you were talking. Some mm -hmm. of what you've said later in the webinar might address it. So maybe we can just hit high points for those. Um, but, um, yeah, just lots of thank yous and, and, and just admiration for the hard work that you and your team have done in, in going through this process and, and making sure that we stand by our ethical and professional values. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, real quick, did I yes. turn off my share screen correctly? Or no, you you've got, we've still got PowerPoint for you. All right. Let me, oh, I remember what I did. There it is. Okay. There we go. Okay. okay sorry All about right. that. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so a question about the funders. So did yeah. the funders um, agree to the dual content? Uh, let me see if I can. Um, the last statement in the consent where you were using parts of the data for the research and all of it was not archived. Uh, were the funders OK with this or did, did you have a conversation with them and what did that look like? Um, didn't really have a conversation with them, sort of said, this is what we think is trauma informed practice and this is what we're doing. <laughs> and they said, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, but I think that also because they were genuinely curious um, of would, would people pull out their data and they didn't. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and so also when talking so kind of similar to that consent process, um, when uh, participants, when you talk to participants uh, during that consent process, were they made aware of what the archive was about, who had access to it? What what information did you give them? Yeah, that's a great question. And I will refer folks to the um, the other articles for sort of a deeper dive. But but briefly, um, yeah, we, we did tell them the, the main thing is, 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 is that we were explaining to them that it was going to other researchers. And because um, NACJD, as I said, has those sort of two sides, and this was going in the protected side where it would be vetted and it would have to go to researchers that wasn't full public access. So if we said it was going to other, we could simplify that because we were all really struggling, like, how do you explain this quickly? We're at the beginning of a, of a complicated process. We're still in that sort of trust building phase. Um, so we said it will go to other researchers to learn and, and study, but it will be de-identified. Here's everything we're going to take out. Um, and like I said, that seemed fine. But again, I want to highlight, these are our research population was a traumatized population who had also been through court. So that didn't absolve us of our responsibilities in any way, shape or form not to protect their, but, but they were kind of used to a level of like, my life's been literally on the public stage. So that could be a factor too, of why they were like, yeah, I'm good with this. Um. And just kind of to highlight some of that, um, can you give a little bit more context about the archiving demand? So the data, is it in, is it open archive? And how do you feel about qualitative data sharing under data sharing agreements in comparison to the approach that you took? So the, the data are in um, a protected archive. They're, they're, they're not, um, I, 
I had someone say, well, that's on open science. It's not publicly available. And I'm like, I think my definition of open science may be a little bit different than others, that I am sharing data, but I'm sharing it. I'm making it available to a subset of the general population, qualified researchers. And I sleep fine at night with that decision, given the sensitivity of the data, because I do think it's important to be transparent um, with the research community. My data, I don't think really work well um, on the on the public scale, but I think it does work well um, in sharing it in the research population. Yeah, and I, I do think that that aligns very well with the concept of as, as open as possible, but as closed as necessary, right? It's, it's a exactly. trade-off. It's not right. all 100% open. Anybody can look at it, but it, it's also mm -hmm. not entirely closed. Uh, so making um, making that available is, is going to be really important. Right. Uh, and you know, they, they yeah, keep going with the questions. <laughs> sure. I want to make sure everybody gets, we get as many questions as we can. Yeah. Um, uh, an interesting question. Um, so the strategies that you developed for the interview study, um, how did you apply them or not, or how might they apply or not to other types of qualitative evidence like field notes? Field notes. Wow. Yeah. So I do have field notes for this um for parts of this particular project. Um, I think that's where you start getting into when you when you kind of go down the, the literature on open science and qual research, um, you'll find kind of mixed views <laughs> on this where, where I think some who do that really in-depth ethnographic work feel really hesitant about sharing the field notes. Um, I think that you could use these same sort of principles. I think that there would be parts of field notes that would be, um, there would be reasonable justification for redacting parts of it. Um, some of them, um, it's practice in field notes that you bracket you, and, and you're supposed to bracket your own emotions and feelings and things. That's part of how you get um, sort of your validity and disentangle your participants' perspectives from your from your things. Um, I could make I could see a scenario where people would want to share that. Um, as part of a dialogue about how they do that and others who may not want to, because what they're unburdening themselves in the field notes is different emotions that they have, different experiences that they're having. So I think that's kind of an interesting space. But I, again, I think the same thing is, is the field notes are basically um, you recounting what you've seen and what you've experienced. Names, dates, details can be blurred, remediated. Um, or the like. Um, I think that there would be a fair amount of resistance to doing that, but I, I think it's an open question um, about how that could be done and what it might look like. Thank you. Um, one question about process. Um, so you thought of a lot of different issues as you were working through uh, this entire research study. Um, did you did you do any brainstorming in the beginning with like a mind map or was this I heard a bit of like you were flagging issues as they came along. Um, can you talk a little bit about like the I guess the mix of like what you were able to identify in the beginning versus what came up and how also how did that impact your budget and timeline, which you talked about a, a little bit, but invitation to say more if you wanted. I'm going to be really honest here. This was me. La, 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 la. I mean, it was, I literally had so much to worry about. I knew it was coming. I knew that we had to do with the informed consent. I knew enough that I needed to hold back some budget. I, I estimated, I think like three or four months to do this. Um, I held, you know, so I, I, I knew it was coming, but I didn't think about it a whole heck of a lot. Um, so I, um, I figured out a lot along the way. I wouldn't recommend that. And that's one of the reasons why we wrote the paper, <laughs> to be honest. I mean, talk about transparency here was this is that because I felt like, you know, we were, we were building, you know, there's a lot of metaphors here. We were building the plane as we were flying it. Um, and, and, and at the same time, I did kind of want to come into it with like, okay, here we are. What are we going to do with this? Um, and, and really try to do that. And I think the mind map up ahead of time, um, would have been a really helpful thing. Um, I, I love that idea. What was most helpful to me was having that incredible sense of panic and sitting down with the prosecutors and basically just getting, you know, yelled at for for days while while we work through that with them. That's just, just the way they communicate. Um, but that was really helpful to me. So that that lesson learned of like go find your subject matter experts um, for that roots level, dirt level, um, that I think is transferable to lots of people. And I encourage that. 
And I don't know that you can do that ahead of time. Maybe you can, but at the very least we needed it then. And it was really helpful then. Um, a question about de-identification and anonymization. This is a lot of work as you pointed out. Mm -hmm. um, and it, and it can reduce the richness and the usefulness of the data um, and implies a risk of, of re-identification. Um, so the question here was, um, I guess about your decision. So you have like a, uh, managed access, um, option, um, weighing that against archiving the data in a repository that in, in uses encryption, um, implemented access control, um, without, uh, well, I guess you, I mean, you did do that. So you did have, um, managed access. Mm -hmm. um, manage access. so can you actually talk a little bit about the metadata, um, that you included? Did you guys talk through that with, I, I'm assuming ICPSR mm, uh, about how to make it so it's discoverable still and so people are able to, to access it? Yep. So, um, you know, the information about where it's archived is shared in the paper. The DOI is available. It may not be fully up yet. Um, the curators are still double, double checking all of that, but the DOI is establishing all of that. We do have some code books. We do have some manuals. Um, we did a pretty good job, we hope. Um, and when we redacted something of, of being clear what, what was redacted, so you know what the whole is. Um, and there were a couple of times where it just says redacted because knowing what the whole was, was too identifiable or too risky in our assessment, but that was actually pretty rare that we did that. So we did try to provide some metadata again to future users um, about what they're seeing. All right. <clears throat> um, another question about process, um, were the individual remediated transcripts shared back with the individual participants again, thinking about this participatory? Right. Approach. That's a great question. And um, again, something that, that had I built the plane a little bit more um, before we started flying um, might have had, might have had a different response there. So here's the thing. Um, this is a very difficult population to recruit. This is an incredibly difficult population to recruit. And part of the appeal, if you will, for them is, is that it's a one-time engagement. I have a long-term relationship with the service agency, the prosecutors, this, that, and the other. But between us and the survivors, there's sort of a, an ethos of, I'm going to come, I'm going to tell you. There's kind of a, a healing piece in that as well I've written about. and bye, see ya. Um, so it did occur to us too, at the end of like, I would really like to share this back with the participant to see if she, he, or they are okay with this. We had no mechanism to do that. Our consent was set up as a one-time thing. Um, and that was important because our, our, our victim service agency partner said, if you make this a repeated thing, Thing. I don't think they're going to do this. They've been through a repeated thing. They will give back kind of one more time, but only one more time. So it is something I would like to kind of tinker with in future research to see if there is a subgroup who might be interested in that or make give it as a choice. I mean, it was kind of a paternalistic decision um, to, to you know, not even do that. We just kind of did it one way. And I would like to open up a little bit more option um, and see if folks might want to do that and might want to reread it. Um, I'm not sure how many would, um, it means going back over traumatic material yet again, but that's not my decision. It's their decision. I just couldn't offer that decision because of the way I set up my consent process. Thank you. Yeah. I think that that's really helpful for folks that are planning new projects and thinking yes. about how they might want to do this is, is what options are we going to give? So I yeah. think that that's really important. Um, I love this question, and I think you'll have uh, some things to say. Um, this uh, attendee is a program officer for a grant program that requires applicants to submit data management plans, um, and so encouraging them to think about balancing confidentiality and openness, um, yep. think of different elements that can be shared. Um, and so um, this person was struck by how often these DMPs say, like, due to the sensitivity of the data, nothing can be shared. Right. Um, and so they have, they're wondering, like, what advice can we can we give these folks? Mm -hmm. So I think I, I think that this idea that the that the data are too sensitive to share is is a very real normal human reaction for folks doing um, work with marginalized minoritized populations and and I I honor that feeling I've had that feeling because um, 
there, there's so many populations that have been actively harmed by the research community, um, Native communities, um, Black Americans, so, so, so many. So, you know, it's like, let's be careful here, folks. <laughs> um, and, and, and sometimes you, you, that notion that you can't share it or you shouldn't share it or you're too sensitive. I don't want either side to get too in their bunker on that. I don't want one side to say it is impossible. It can't be done. It shouldn't be done because I think that there is an important part about um, our role as a researcher in making voices heard by others. You know, um, we don't speak for the participants, they speak for themselves. And the extent to which we can share their data using as much of their voice, literally or figuratively, um, of, of people, that that's, that's important. Um, and at the same time, I don't want to get people in the bunker saying everything can be shared. See, here's proof. You know, even the most traumatized, you know, ah, our mind's a pretty unusual situation. So let's not overgeneralize from mine either. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't have a great answer other than that. I think that it should be kind of an open conversation among funders. And I, I don't want people to have the, the kind of knee jerk reaction on either side. Oh, um, you must share. Um, oh, you can't share. It's like, whoa, 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 stop, 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 stop. Think, talk, look at um, look at what's happening, look at the different resources. Is it possible? Um, rather than just assuming that it, it, it isn't possible or that it automatically is possible. Wonderful. Um, uh, an interesting question about how you see the data, what types of reuse of your data do you, do you foresee? Um, and are there reuses that you think will not be possible after your cleaning process? Um, I think one key thing that's that's absolutely going to be impossible with our data is anybody who really wanted to do any kind of discourse analysis on how survivors talk about their assaults. I mean, that's just not possible. We, we literally took it out and replaced it with a summary of variables. Um, so, but I don't know that people doing that kind of work would go to these data anyway for that kind of question. Um, there's other ways and other data sets that, that you would probably go to for that instead, um, where the identifiability risk is, is lower. Again, remember, if my, my city is public, you know, if that weren't on the table um, in the review process, one of my reviewers was like, you know, damn, you know, if you didn't have that, think about how many other things might be available. And I was like, yeah, you're right. You know, but, but when you know literally where it is, which courthouse, which FOIA office you go to, um, it, does, it does constrain you quite a bit. So I think that it's going to be not super helpful in that way. But I think for folks who really want to understand how the criminal legal system treats sexual assault survivors, there's very rich data there. So yeah, the questions are just coming in as, as quickly as we can answer them. This is awesome. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. Um, so a question about uh, how would you decide how much people on the research team could handle or when to tag in mm -hmm. and out? So what kind of characteristics would you look for within the team in the future? Yeah, that's a good question. And it's it's sort of part of a bigger um aperture we have in our teams around vicarious trauma that while they were interviewing, we had those structures in place and we just had to continue to apply them here. And again, my underestimation was sort of like how much, how much wear and tear this was going to cause. So it would be part of it. It's proactive on a PI to just rotate people in and out. Um, there are power dynamics here between a researcher and his, her, or their team. Um, you know, I'm your doctoral advisor, I'm your employer, people are going to be very reluctant to say, hey, you know, I need a break. I try to create an environment where they will do that. But again, not at the risk of being paternalistic, but I just need to be mindful that with power differentials, people might not do that. So there's just a rotate in and a rotate out um, that that just happens. And actually, that takes care of a lot of it, knowing that you get a break, you know, you rotate in, you rotate out, you know that a break's coming. And then, um, you know, people could let me know, they might let another team member know who might say, mm, I'm going to take over somebody's shift. And I'm like, absolutely. And then providing support for each other within the team. But again, also rep recognizing people may not want their support from me, they want support, mm -hmm. and I need to step back so that they can go do that. But it doesn't 
need to be me and maybe it shouldn't be me, but I can hold the space for them to go get the support that they need. Thank you. Um, so I know we're kind of at the hour. Um, I have a quick question. Would you be willing to share your slides with us? We usually send a follow-up. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. So um, we will- It would be pretty hypocritical. I believe in transparency. No, you can't have my slides. <laughs> yes. Awesome. So we'll, four folks will have the slides, we'll have the recording, and also we'll we'll be sure to include those those papers that were mentioned um, in, in, in the presentation as well, so folks can have it. Um, maybe this is probably a perfect question to end on. Um, and uh, if, if you could do anything differently, um, it, whether that's in the data management plan, the ar archiving preparation stage or anything else, um, what, what would that be? And that might be our last question, unfortunately. I actually wouldn't do anything different because I went into this wanting the journey. I, want, I went into this with a mindset of curiosity of being a learner. Um, I'm kind of old in my career. Um, I'm the old dog. I'm the dinosaur. I wanted to learn some new tricks. I wanted to learn new things. So I, 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 I let that happen. And I wanted that to happen. I wanted that experience of feeling unsure and confused and naive to learn and to remember what it feels like to learn. That was really important to me. So me personally, I wouldn't do anything different because I really wanted that, that experience. Um, practically, I would have start, I would start the prep on um, the de-identification at the time you're cleaning the transcripts. Because you have to clean the transcripts um, and check for accuracy when you're doing qualitative analysis. And I could have saved some wear and tear if we started doing some of the immediate safe harbor stuff then. So that, that's, that's a concrete tip of, of something I wish I would have done differently. But otherwise, I really wanted to see what I could learn. And I hope that came through in today's webinar. And I hope it came through in the paper of somebody not knowing the space, trying to learn this space and to share what it feels like to learn this space. Awesome. This was, this was excellent. Um, there's so much uh, positivity flowing. At I you see some of it. I, I can't see chance. all of it, but I thank you. I thank you for welcoming me into your new space. Um, I hope it's useful. And I look forward to meeting some of you and learning more about what you're doing. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for coming. Right. Um, please uh, check out any other events that we have. Um, and uh, we hope to hear from all of you soon. Thanks. Thank you. Take care, everyone.